Enduro racing, possibly the toughest mountain bike discipline out there. I mean, where else do you find the fitness levels of a World Cup cross country combined with the technicality and skill of World Cup downhill? I mean, roll that all into a tidy little bundle and what have you got? Well, what I think is the toughest discipline out there. Now, a typical downhill World Cup can be anything from two to five minutes, with courses going from one and a half to three kilometers, and dropping anything from 380 to 600 meters, say. In comparison, a World Cup cross country is around 25K and lasts for an hour and a half, possibly a bit more. In that race, they'll probably climb just above a thousand meters or so. Now let's take a look at a typical EWS, and I think we'll use Madeira from 2019 as a good example. Now this is a two day race, so you also have two days of practice before that. The shortest stage of Madeira was about 1.25k and time wise about three minutes, with the longest being seven minutes and nearly three kilometers long. On that 3k stage, you also drop about 500 meters. That was stage one of day one, and we're talking a Fort William style track just to get you going. As if that wasn't wild enough, say, other stages throughout the series can be absolute behemoths of trails. Take Chile 2018, for example. In that race, I remember doing a 20 minute long stage that dropped 1700 meters, uh, and it was just insane, like 11 kilometers. Just imagine that the next time you go out for a ride, just smashing 11 kilometers downhill as fast as you can. Long days in the saddle are almost compulsory when you race enduro. From the moment you leave the pits in the morning to start the race right the way through to the end of the day when you finally cross that finish line, it's almost expected that you're going to be putting in some serious mileage and sitting on that saddle of yours for a long time. If doing that for a day sounds tough, then try doing it for four. You're definitely going to want to make sure that you've got a good chamois and saddle combo because those guys, they are putting in some serious time. I think that just goes to show that these EWS athletes are absolute weapons. Not only can they put in such long hours on the bike, but also they can still competently race whilst doing that. So not only can they pedal and pedal all day long between all these different stages doing these mental uphill liaisons, but then they've still got to have the mental capacity to be able to race back down as fast as they can. And like I said, time in the saddle doesn't mean that a potentially sore posterior is coming your way, but also the mental gain. You have got to stay sharp for the entire event, from practice where you need to spot lines to remembering those lines come race day. It's not just tough on bodies and minds then, it's tough on bikes as well. Because of the brutality of enduro racing, ever since its inception, bike development has been sped up. Riders and manufacturers alike are calling for bikes to be more and more capable and able to deal with the conditions that they're put through, whilst at the same time still maintaining a reasonable weight and efficiency. Now more than ever, we're seeing a new breed of bikes come through which are just more and more capable. Bikes nowadays are tackling tracks that downhill bikes probably couldn't do 10, 15 years ago. Uh, the new breed of bikes is coming with wireless shifting, new suspension designs and new frame designs constantly pushing the boundaries. With things moving so fast, it's amazing to see that bike development is a constantly evolving thing year upon year. I definitely believe that bike development as a byproduct of enduro racing has been sped up. There are parts on our bikes now that we probably wouldn't have dreamt of not too long ago. The same with wheel sizes and various parts like droppers have really altered the way we think. If you think about a dropper, not too long ago we were using these ropey cable actuated designs. Now these cable actuated designs are super duper refined giving infinite travel, even going hydraulic or wireless. I mean who'd have thought of that? Not me. No. Races are generally over the course of a weekend and can be one or two days, more often than not two days, but, and you'll usually get two days of practice. So you can range from two to four days of constant riding, that's a lot of saddle time for anyone to be doing. Combine this with how much mileage you do over those days and it far surpasses most other styles of racing. 
To be able to tackle such arduous events, well, riders will put in a ton of training. Big days out on the bike to get their bodies and minds used to being able to cope with this kind of event. A typical event you could do over 100 kilometers with thousands of meters both ascending and descending. Of course, riding and racing over multiple days does link nicely to bike development, allowing riders to do this more comfortably and without any chance of a decrease in performance, now that bikes are just so good at being able to tackle what they're supposed to be able to. Restrictions and limitations on equipment. Now, this is something that's quite specific to enduro racing. You can't just smash your bike to pieces. It's not gonna do you any favors with your mechanic or your wallet. Certain rules state that riders must finish with the same equipment that they started with. Commissaires at the beginning of the race will put stickers on certain parts of the bike to make sure that these parts aren't changed. They'll check this through the race and at the end. What parts of the bike then do get stickered up? Well, the front and rear triangle, the forks, and the wheels. So should a rider have to change any of these during a race, say they smash a wheel or crack a frame, then there is a hefty time penalty going to be incurred. Normally about five minutes, so it's a, you know, enough to write your race off. Why do they do this? Well, it's so that none of the big teams can just be swapping out bits left, right and center. Also, it encourages a rider to sort of maintain and look after their bike over the whole weekend. You can, however, swap out smaller parts like a mech, uh, chains, brake levers, or even a whole brake actually. But you can only do that if you carry the parts on you. You're not allowed outside assistance unless you get to a technical zone, at which point a mechanic can then help you. Because of this then, riders will often opt for stronger parts over lighter weight parts. Now that is just so that they see through the weekend without any issues. You can change parts from race to race obviously, but during that race, you've got to start and finish with the same bit. So a rider might go for a heavier, burlier wheel set with an insert over a lighter weight wheel set, just so that they make sure they get it through the entirety of the race. With a relatively new format of racing comes a relatively new breed of rider. Now you might be mistaken for thinking that back in the day when this first came around, that it's where ex downhillers or possibly downhillers at the end of their career would then go to try and keep on racing, or it's just a format that anyone can have a go, and both might be true. Certainly anyone can have a go at enduro, but nowadays there is a new breed of younger rider coming through. The old guard would use experience to win. With such big days out on the bike, the younger rider possibly didn't know how to tackle this at the time. That's just not true anymore. Young guns like Richie Rude, Raffaella Richter, Ella Connolly, and Adrian Daly are absolute podium contenders at every single race and never ones to be sniffed at proving that enduro is for everybody. It also just goes to show that riders are adapting and learning to this new style of racing, with younger riders adapting their training to be more used to this, rather than just some of the young guns from downhill coming over, having a go, and not being able to cut it for the day. All riders are really putting the time and effort in to absolutely smash this event. Finally, let's talk tactics. An enduro race isn't quite the 100% on the edge, absolute limit of a downhill race. Neither is it the cardiac arrest inducing feeling of a cross country race. However, it is very close to both. Riders will often ride at near maximum. We're talking 98%, not quite on the limit, but near or thereabouts. And that is because it's a long season and a long race. So they just don't want to push the limit. It's just tempting fate. With an eight round season and every round counting towards the overall, it's just not worth pushing that hard. It's too risky and the chances of a crash or breaking your bike are just too high. That's just why they wind it back that little bit. Of course, that takes immense skill to be able to ride on or very near the edge without pushing it. Finally, an enduro race that requires possibly the most tactics of all is the Trophy of Nations. Now this is made up of teams of three riders from each nation. Those riders then have to choose what order they go in, how much gap they leave between each other and how hard to push. So a lot of decisions to make. Do you send the fastest down first for the other guys to chase? Or do you send them at the back to try and encourage them along? What do you do? I don't know. Whatever tactics these guys choose, the last rider across the line is the one when the timer stops. So you've really got to think quite carefully about what you do there. 
This adds a whole new dimension to the enduro racing and really makes it quite interesting. I hope you've enjoyed watching then why I think enduro racing is the toughest discipline. I may be slightly biased because I've raced a lot of EWS, but I've raced XC and Downhill as well, and I think enduro just nudges it. Let us know what you think in the comments below. I'd love to hear what you think, and I'll catch you next time. Thanks, everybody.